Inside Psychology Nerds, and welcome to Psychology and Stuff, the podcast out of Phoenix Studios at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. I'm Ryan Martin, one of the hosts of Psychology and Stuff, and I'm here as always with my co host. She's the chair of the UW Green Bay Psychology Program, my good friend, Dr. Georgina Wilson Dungeness. How's it going, G? It is going very well. So, November is one of my favorite months of the year, like thinking about like delicious autumn kinds of foods that you could cook and uh, those kinds of things. So it is definitely a uh, crunchy leaf and uh, pumpkin spice, everything season. So, you know, apple, I am, si- I apple am, cider donuts, apple oh, cider yes. donuts from Door oh, County oh, yeah. are yeah. my fave. And so oh, yeah. I, I am definitely uh, feeling the November vibe. Yes, we are. Um, I am. I feel the same way. And by the way, I love, love, love apple cider donuts. You just heard our guest, by the way. I'll introduce him in a second. But <laughs> I love, love, love apple cider donuts. As some of our listeners know, I used to work at an apple orchard slash pumpkin patch slash, I mean, basically a farm, right? I don't have to go through all of their crops. <laughs> but, uh, but they were most famous for apples and their apple cider donuts were unbelievable. Um, hard. In fact, it's been mm. hard for me to find uh, similar ones elsewhere since I grew up. Um, yes. And we should say like, we're recording this in October. It doesn't come out till November 18th, but we're like two days away from Halloween. Do you have Halloween plans? Uh, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of Halloween, but I am a big fan of candy. And so I had to make sure I bought all of the candy that I hate at home. Um, so I bought a whole bunch of like really like mega packs, like large packs of Sour Patch Kids, because I feel like kids deserve large candy this year. Like Mm -hmm. they missed out on like a lot of Halloween festivities. So I bought like regular size bags of, um, of Sour Patch Kids that I hate. I hate Sour Patch Kids, but uh, kids are going to be so excited when they come to my door and I give them like 12 of them. I bought so much candy. I I can't tell you. I mean, it's funny that you chose that because I will actually eat Sour Patch Kids until I'm in pain. And I have proof of this. I, I literally once at a movie bought, they had like a candy dispenser and I bought like a giant bag of, of Sour Patch Kids. And I, I ate them in the movie until my mouth hurt that I was like something about the, (laughs) the sourness was actually causing me. I, I honestly, I would not have been surprised at all if I had been bleeding and I <laughs> just kept going. So it's weird that you, uh, you, you selected that as the candy you hate. Well, my dentist told me that the worst thing that you can do for your teeth is eat something sweet and sour, uh, oh. at the same time. And, you know, I'm like, kind of obsessed about dental hygiene. And yep. so I definitely, I never ate another Sour Patch again. Wow. I got to tell you, I think your dentist is a liar. I can think of way worse things that you could do to <laughs> someone's teeth. I hit them with a hammer. Uh, would be worse. <laughs> I saw, I watched the, when I say the new Halloween movie, I mean the 2018 Halloween movie, not the brand new one. I watched it just a little while ago. He pulls out a bunch of teeth out of someone. Drops them on the floor of the bathroom. That's worse for your teeth than Sour Patch Kids. So we can revisit this when we're talking about the truth. And (laughs) like, is it true that uh, Sour Patch Kids are the the worst? I'm going to have our guest weigh in on that later. I mean, I just- Let's introduce Kelsey and (laughs) and see what she's up to. (laughs) We should. I, I hope real quick, before we introduce Kelsey, I hope real quick that in the next Halloween movie, there's a scene where he's just feeding someone Sour Patch Kids. (laughs) That, that that is the direction they go. All right, Kelsey, how's it going? It's going well. It's going real well. I um I love Sour Patch Kids, so now my life has been shattered because <laughs> I care about my teeth, and now I don't know. And I have also done it to the point where it hurt to eat them. So yeah. now my entire world got flipped upside down in the last like five minutes or whatever. <laughs> um, but no, it's it's been great. I absolutely love 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 fall, just like Georgina. Um, my favorite is being able to wear big scarves and boots and all of that. I just like being comfy, cozy, and you can't really do that in summer because it's too hot. So that's my favorite. Nice. Yeah, well, I'm excited that it's two to one on Sour Patch Kids. When we get to our guests, we're going to have to ask him 
uh, what what uh, what he thinks of Sour Patch Kids. I'm a little scared it's it's going to end in a tie though, so we'll have to bring in someone new. Um, before we actually get to our guests, I want to mention quickly the Common Cause Conference we've got coming up at the end of November. By the time you're hearing this, it's just a couple weeks away. Um, and that's actually part of the reason why, a big reason why we've got our guests here today. So um, the theme of this year's conference is truth, information, misinformation, and democracy. Uh, and this is a conference that we do every year at, uh, uh, at UW-Green Bay through the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Um, we got all sorts of exciting stuff happening with speakers on topics ranging from journalism to storytelling to conspiracy theories. Uh, for those of you who are interested, it's on November 29th and 30th at the Widener Center, but there's going to be tons of virtual programming as well. So even if you're listening to this and you live out of, uh, out of the area, you can, uh, you can check it out. Um, you can learn more, and we'll post this in the show notes, but you can learn more at uh, UWGB slash Common Cause, and that's cause is spelled C-A-H-S-S. Um, I bring it all up because this episode, like I said, is really part of that conference. We're going to be talking today about the psychology behind some important concepts related to the acceptance of the truth. And so with that, I think we should get to our guest. Are you ready, G? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. So our guest today is the chair of the political science department here at UW-Green Bay. He has a PhD in political science from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and studies political behavior, voting behavior, political psychology, amongst other things. Today, he's going to talk to us about belief perseverance. It's Dr. Aaron Weinshank. How's it going, Aaron? Very good. Very good. Thanks for having me. And I will, I am a proponent of Sour Patch Kids, so <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a fan. How do you, how do you feel about being hit in the mouth with a hammer? Is that oh, I try, to avoid, I try to avoid that. Okay, so we're all in agreement on that, I believe, that we're, it's a 4-0 vote. Good. We're, we're back. We're a team again. I'm happy that we're on the same page. Um, so let's, let's just start with a, a definition for our listeners of what uh, belief perseverance is. And, and I really just very quickly want to preface this by saying, I think, Aaron, you were the person to introduce this concept to me. Maybe you don't remember that, but it was in very beginning of your time at UWGB. I think we were just chatting and you mentioned this idea to me. So let's talk about it. Look at me teaching you things. I know. Thank you. <laughs> um, it, it's, basically, it's basically just what it sounds like, maintaining a belief in uh, even though there might be contradictory information that comes to you or comes in or it, it exists somewhere that you know about. So maintaining your, your belief in something that there's counter information about. And I, I've been I'm thinking a lot about that because I actually had to look up the definition because <laughs> I didn't know. I mean, I, I thought I knew it, but I thought with that kind of, uh, uh, term that I should actually look it up and make sure that I'm not uh, doing belief perseverance, <laughs> that I believe that I know something when I don't. Um, but I was thinking about what I teach in my statistics class is that um, we are, as scientists, we are constantly revising our belief systems. And that seems to be confusing to um, people who maybe don't consider themselves scientists or, or don't understand what science is all about. How, do, how does that play into this? Yeah, I think that's a good, that's a good point. Like, right, we're, we're updating, sometimes theories get tweaked, sometimes new data comes in that uh, shows that some concept that we thought existed doesn't hold up. But I think that the difference is like we're using the scientific process, right, to make sure we're, we're getting information in a systematic way. And I think oftentimes that doesn't happen, right? And somebody who just like out in the out in the real world, somebody uh, gets some belief or gets some idea and, you know, it, they reject information that comes in through this process, basically, or, the, or they're not even willing to hear new information that comes in from scientific studies or, you know, right, there's no adaptation in their views. You know, if they believe that voter fraud is rampant and widespread, and that then no studies of it, in fact, one just came out in Wisconsin, really well done, that showed election went off pretty much without a hitch, but right, if, if you really believe that idea, then that report 
collected in very systematic ways, it, you think nothing of it, right? You're probably not going to read it. You're probably not going to consider it. And, and even if experts say, you know, there's this new information that counters this thing, right? It's like, don't want to hear about it. You know, I think what Georgina just said is really important. And I want to, I want to talk about masks in a second, because I think this is a really interesting example, but I want to go back because so uh, the late Dr. Scott Lilienfeld was a very well-known uh, psychologist, scientist, um, a psychological scientist uh, passed away about a year ago, but he, he spoke at GB a couple of times. And one of the things he said that I really, or I noticed when he, when he spoke is when he would talk about scientific findings, he would say things like, and that's probably not accurate anymore, or that's probably true instead of saying it is true or it isn't true. And I asked him about it later. He was a guest on this podcast and I asked him uh, about it later. And he said, well, he, he kept saying science is provisional, right? That science, that, that findings are, are true until we learn something else. And I think that this ends up being a really a significant challenge for the public, that they have a very hard time and it ends up feeling to them like we don't know what we're talking about or scientists don't know what we're talking about. Is that, does that sound fair to you? What do you think, Aaron? Yeah, yeah, most definitely. I, I try to do that same thing when I write papers where I'll, I'll say uh, th these findings should be taken as preliminary until we get replications in different contexts with different samples. So I really like that. Like, I, I like that caveat, right, where it's like, you know, this is likely this is the best available evidence right now. But like, I mean, there, there are huge findings that have like eventually been, you know, disconfirmed where, you know, people have done more sophisticated studies, done them on larger, better samples. And it's like, oh yeah, it really doesn't hold up very much. You know, and that's not people changing their minds. It's like, this was the best study design at the time. We figured out a way to improve that. And it turned out some of the things, you know, didn't hold up. So I, yeah, I really like that idea. But I do think that it can come up, it can come across if you don't know the process as people, you know, just changing their minds because right. they feel like it, right? And people don't yeah. understand the whole process of, you know, looking at the literature, trying to improve it, devising another study to test the same idea, and then, you know, comparing to, to what we know from the past. I mean, it sounds like uncertainty to people who, who aren't aware of the scientific method. And I mean, ultimately, I think it's fair to say it is uncertainty, but it's uncertainty rooted in, in sort of logic and a rational approach, not uncertainty rooted in, uh, in a, a lack of awareness or lack of knowledge. Yep. And I think that uh, I remember as like a, a young person that there, there were commercials on TV that would be like four out of five dentists prefer Colgate and then four out of five dentists prefer Crest. And I always thought to myself as a, as a young person before I uh, studied the, the scientific method, well, this just doesn't seem right. And it, it instills in um, people who are not educated about the scientific method, um, some real doubt about, are we being tricked or misled by uh, data and scientific evidence? What yeah. about that? Yeah, I think also people, I think that people are really, they're, they're not good with uncertainty, but also when there's competing, in, there's competing findings in a body of literature, that really throws people off. In fact, I've, I've had students have encounter this and like they don't know what to make of it because we want one answer, right? We want there to be one thing that causes it or we want to know, is it, is it this or is it not this, right? But like for a lot of scientific questions, you know, some studies find this, some studies find this, they can contradict. And then, you know, often as scientists, we're trying to, we're trying to figure out, can we synthesize them? Is there something about the sample? You know, we want to figure out why did one find this and one find the other? Is there something going on where parts of each are true? And I think it's really hard when you have a body of work where there's, there's competing ideas. Yeah, there's a big difference between uh, a single study and then the, the body of evidence or the body of literature. And this, I think, really becomes a challenge. I, I noticed this in my courses that, that this becomes a challenge when it's, well, you said this, but I found this study that found this. It's like, right. And, and that's great. And that one study is important. And I don't want to dismiss that. But we also have to look at this whole, uh, this whole body of evidence and this whole picture. 
it feels, I mean, Aaron, you, you brought up one example with, with election fraud and, and mentioned Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. It feels though that, that a place where this has been a real issue in the last two years has to do with COVID. Where, where have you seen examples, I think, of belief perseverance um, w- with regard to COVID over the last two years? Yeah, I, I, I've, I totally agree. I've heard when like the CDC or Dr. Fauci would, you know, recommend something, then ease and then recommend again. People, people took that to mean it, he's just changing his mind, right? Or the CDC is just changing their mind, right? Oh, they, they thought masks were good. Now they don't think they're good. And, now, and then they think they're good again, right? But it's like studies are coming in. They're trying to make sense of them. They're trying to do the best for public health. So I, I heard that complaint in the context of like CDC recommendations for distancing in the context of uh, masking, things like that, pre- kind of precautions regarding COVID. And, and they, I think like Dr. Fauci and other members of the CDC really tried to make the point that like science is coming in, we're trying to make decisions as these studies are being conducted and as we're learning more and it's really hard to know <laughs> exactly what to do. So we're trying to do the best that we can. And do you think that that kind of situation, like a, a very public where decisions are changing back and forth really gets to like a confirmation bias or belief perseverance. Is that like a, a hotbed for that uh, kind of thinking to grow? Politically charged issues, uh, controversial issues, things where like elites, elites on one side or one ideology are saying something and elites on another side are saying a different recommendation, I, th- those are places where the, the, it's right for this kind of thing to take off. Yeah, I didn't, you know, in, in hindsight, I recognize this. I certainly didn't recognize it at the time, but in, in back in, you know, March of 2020, but this feels like the perfect scenario to have a real sort of crisis of information that one, you have inadequate information uh, about something simply because it was new. Um, two, you have this, what ends up being a politically charged issue in, a, in an election year. Um, or, and so you, you have that element of it as well. Um, and then you have, at the same time, I think a certain amount of scientific illiteracy um, that, that, leads to, um, that leads to just a, a lot of misunderstanding. I mean, I think about, you use the example of masks. I think about something as simple as masks, you know, that... You, I kept hearing people say things like, well, but they, the recommendations keep changing. And I thought, well, do they, or did they change one time, right? In the beginning, they said we didn't need masks. And then they said, you should wear masks, right? And that was, and that's it. Um, at, at some point they said, if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear anymore. And then they said, we should again. I mean, I guess that's it changing, but, but not really. I mean, that's just a different situation, different scenario. Um, Am I misreading that? Does that feel accurate? No, I think I think that's right. I, I think the one danger too is that when people get attached to an idea and they are seriously committed to it, this exists when it comes to vaccines, COVID vaccines, but other vaccines or lots of political ideas. Um, and then you give them new information, right? In the example you just gave, there was new information coming in about like how vaccines work in combination with masks and do we need them when we're vaccinated? That's new, that's new information. But like when new information comes in and you double down on your original idea, right? So like not being receptive to new information, not being open to new information. <laughs> there are studies that show, like it's called the backfire effect where if you find out people's beliefs <clears throat> and then you show them some information saying, hey, that belief is wrong. Experts have said it, you know, 500 times, whatever. They'll believe the wrong thing even more strongly after you correct with new information. That, that's, that's the scary part for me, right? Because like having wrong information and getting new information and revising, that's, you know, that's part of, that's part of life and that's part of experience. But like getting new information and saying like, nope, I ignore that. That's a problem. Yeah. Do you think that also, um, like the very curated social media algorithms that are providing information um, to people plays into that? 
Yeah, I think social me media has made it easier to <laughs> only expose yourself to information you like, uh, for algorithms to show you things that fit with what you like, and you know, for for you to spread things that you like easier, right? It's really easy to just click a button and share a meme with some information about something on it, or you know, a, a photo with some text on it, and it to go out to millions of people. You know, I saw one a couple of years ago where, you know, it was, it was a complaint about Congress and it said, oh, if you serve for even one term, you get full pay every year for the rest of your life, full pension, all benefits. And that's not true. But I mean, if I looked at the number of people who had shared it, it, it was like tens of millions of people. Right. And so it's like it fit with their their idea of Congress being bad. They shared it. Other people believe that too. And then it took off, right? And then probably lots of other people are like, oh, yeah, I knew they were bad. And this just adds to it, right? And it's so easy. It's like costless to share that, right? It's like a click of a button, a couple seconds, and there it can go. You know, it's funny as we're talking about this, I'm thinking about things that I've I've posted on TikTok before. And the the things that seem to A, go the most viral or B, um, where I get the most pushback, they tend to be the same. And it, and it is those findings that run contrary to what people typically believe. So the idea that, that for instance, uh, corporal punishment with kids, spanking actually means that they, will, they are more likely to develop conduct problems and emotional problems and to be quote unquote disobedient. That's a pretty consistent finding in the research, but it runs contrary to what a lot of people believe. And so they, uh, you know, they, they come back at me or I get the most pushback. The other has to do with catharsis and the idea that like punching a pillow when you're angry isn't good for you runs contrary to what people believe or what they've heard. And so they come back at me um, uh, on those. And it, it seems like this is, like, you're absolutely right. Like when people are exposed to things, data that runs contrary to their opinions, they have just a particularly difficult time accepting that. So what do we do about it? I mean, are we doomed? It feels like we're doomed. Are we doomed? <laughs> well, just to touch on something you just mentioned, I think part of the reason why this holds up is because people invest a lot in ideas and beliefs, right? Like I kind of I'm liken it to like, if I'm working really hard on a project and I find a mistake, I'll, I'll be like, oh, maybe, maybe that is right, right? Or like, is there any way that I could salvage this thing? It took me like 10 hours. We've probably all been there, right? Think about that in the context of beliefs. People sometimes put a lot of work into cultivating a belief or finding something, right? And so it can be really a threat to like have something you worked really hard on or invested in or is a connection to your identity politically, <clears throat> or religiously or whatever it might be to have that being threatened and somebody saying that's wrong right and, and usually when you say that's wrong that doesn't go over very well you have to do it so, somewhat differently but i think part of it is this, this investment in in this in an idea right that people can put a lot into it or we all have identities we attach to and feeling a threat to an identity can make us defensive so on some level what you can do as an individual to protect yourself against you know, crossfire or the belief perseverance is be less married to your beliefs, like be, be more aware of them as potentially incorrect. Uh, that, that in some ways, I mean, that, I, I think a lot of people aren't gonna be ready to do that. In fact, I might even have a hard time doing that, but it, but it feels like that's one, sort of solution here is to, for people to just recognize that what they believe may not be true. Yeah, definitely. I think that's great. And that's really hard. I I mean, I teach American government. I've probably taught it 20 times and I, I have a hard time dealing with it. I'm trying to get the students to do it and like learn about ideas they might not like and be okay with other people expressing. And sometimes I hear ideas that just doesn't fit with my interpretation of American government and politics, or, you know, there's some issue that somebody's talking about in a way that I don't feel it should be talked about. And it's, sometimes it's really hard. Like you can feel yourself tense up, right? Cause it's like, no, that's wrong. So it is really hard to, to like go and look at uh, if you're a liberal conservative, policy analysis or if you're a conservative a liberal policy analysis and not just say from the very beginning this is all garbage that's that's really hard to do but actually sometimes you can learn a lot and i think that's 
you might be able to at least get a sense of like why somebody sees the world or strengthen your argument even. So that's what I try to tell students is like, look at things from, from multiple different perspectives. You know, if you're interested in health policy, go, go get a libertarian analysis, go get a conservative analysis, go get a more moderate, get a nonpartisan one, right? And read them from a bunch of different angles and see if you can synthesize. But yes, it is very hard to do that, even for people, even for social scientists, apparently, who have training on, <laughs> on this kind of thing. So yeah, it's pretty hard. Um, another thing I think you, one, one idea on how to deal with this is first to be non-confrontational, just like, just telling people you're wrong. Here's the right information. Studies have done that many times. It doesn't work very well. Um, things that seem to work well are getting people to internalize information. So there's, there's a study I like that, uh, found out that people have, <laughs> this is about a lot of government programs but in this particular one they focused on welfare they have like wildly incorrect ideas of how much money the u.s government spends on welfare and so rather than just like asking people and then saying oh here's what we actually spend they had people first write down the percentage of the u.s budget that we spend on welfare in other areas too but this was focused on welfare and then then they had them write how much should the US government spend on welfare as a share of their total budget? And then they went back and they compared those numbers and they compared them to what the government actually spends. And what they found out is people are way off in their estimates of how much the government spends on welfare. They think it's way higher. And actually a lot of people, what they think the share that, that uh, should be spent is actually higher than what we do spend. Right. And so it's like getting people to engage with the information rather than just saying, what do you think about this? Nope, you're wrong. Here's the right information. It's from this source and it's reputable. So you should believe it. Right. Like so getting getting somebody somebody to do something with it, if you can, um, could be helpful. But, you know, that's pretty hard. Right. <laughs> you right. can't just always sit people down and be like, right, write these numbers down and then let's take a look at them. Hmm. So, so it, it's interesting to me because the so my background is in counseling psychology, right? So I'm trained in these, you know, interventions with individuals. And it's funny because part of what you're describing right now sounds very similar to um, sort of the, the uh, uh, what's it called? Like the intervention method of uh, dealing with a substance abuser versus more of what we call motivational interviewing, right? So when you, when you yell at a substance abuser and you, not yell, but when you, when you come right at them in a direct uh, sort of a assertive or aggressive way and say, hey, your, your substance abuse is a problem, it doesn't typically work, right? They don't, they, they don't often, it's not as likely to work, right? But a motivational interviewing approach is more like what you described. It's sort of like getting on the same side as them. It's working with them to help them understand how maybe their family sees it or some of the ways. And it's much, much, much more likely to be successful, so much so that we've used it in other, we use it with people with anger problems and eating disorders and other sorts of problems. It sounds like there's a motivational interviewing approach to getting people to accept new scientific data too. Yeah, I think that's right. There's also, people, people have tried a lot of things, especially where they found backfire effects. So one thing, one thing that, uh, this is kind of, easier and involves less intervention it's more informational it's just how you present information to people when they have wrong information so there's a study looking at you know vaccine people who don't want to uh, get vaccinated which is not not just covid vaccines but just vaccines in general measles mumps that kind of thing you know there's a group of people who don't want to do that think it's related to other kinds of problems and um, they, they did experiments where they randomized kind of people to get different types of information and, and some they, they focused on vaccine safety. These things are safe and they found that that didn't work. Just telling people who don't like them or don't want to give them to themselves or their families, just saying they're, they're safe. Scientists have shown us they're safe. doesn't work very much. The thing that did work, at least in, in this study, I'll give it a caveat like we, <laughs> like we mentioned before is focusing on the risks to not getting kids vaccinated. So focusing on the risks to not getting vaccinated, this kind of thing can happen. Here's the frequency, here's the end result possibly. And I'm, I'm wondering if, a, you know, focusing on a, what we would say is a vulnerable population, children might have something to do with it, but that's just like talking about the issue in a slightly different way, right? It's still getting at the same point of 
vaccines are being a useful thing and preventing future problems, but it's just focusing on a different element. And they found that that uh, worked okay. So as educators, like we are in a unique um, position uh, not to indoctrinate uh, students to the ways in which we believe, but uh, to help students understand that science is not perfect. I always say that, like uh, science, the scientific method, we know that there are always errors and it's our job as scientists to try and reduce errors and increase generalizability of our findings. And so uh, I see my job as an educator is to educate students exactly that. Like how do we reduce error in our methodology and how do we increase generalizability um, to a larger population? Uh, what are some other things that you see as a, a way that educators can help um, the community grow against this kind of um, bias in thinking? Well, what you said, first of all, is great. And I try to do that same thing. I'm sure that you've had students read articles and summarize them. And I want to, I want to know what they think the article is about too. But the, the next thing I want to talk about is what things could be off about this? What choices that people made could influence the results? So we're always looking at, you know, what is the design of the study and how could that influence the results? Where did the sample come from? So I think teaching people how to digest that information is really good. Um, I try to do things where I get students to take on the perspectives of groups or parties or ideologies they don't necessarily agree with. Some studies have shown that perspective taking is really good. In fact, I just had my students in American government class do an assignment where they had to investigate a political party in the United States. And one of the things I said, they could pick whatever they want, but I said, if there's one you think you don't like very much, pick that one and investigate it because it might give you a sense, you know, often we operate on like caricatures of parties or ideologies, dive into it, see if there's, if there's anything that you could understand about it, that you could see connecting to a party you like. So I think doing things like that, where we kind of urge people to look at information and actually a lot of them did pick parties that they weren't familiar with, or sometimes flat out told me, I, I really don't like that, but I wanted to see something about it. And I wanted to learn a little bit of something about it. And sometimes they do tell me that like, hey, you know, I still don't agree with it, but I could at least see why they think that uh, there needs to be less government intervention in issue A, B, or C. And so I think that's valuable, right? Because maybe that gives them a sense of like how to engage with somebody. It's like, you know, I don't agree with you, but I could see why, you know, you might like that idea. And then is there anything that we could work on together on that issue? So that kind of, that kind of exercise, I think, you know, practicing where you are encountering information you don't necessarily like, um, that can be really good rather than just telling people do this thing, you know, telling people to do something without any practice, usually it doesn't work very well, right? People need, if you want them to be a really good speaker, most people are not naturally just Boom, awesome speakers. You got to work up to it, right? And like practice and practice and practice and, and then you get better at it. So giving people tasks like that where they can do some of these things, I think is, is pretty valuable. Aaron, this has been absolutely fabulous. I'm going to come back in a moment to talk about Common Cause and what we're all doing there and how this fits in. But first, we should get to five questions. Kelsey, do you have five questions for Dr. Aaron Weinshank? Yeah. I do have five questions and thank you so much for just being on our, on our podcast today. It's yeah. so, so interesting hearing all of your unique perspectives. Um, okay. So pretty easy question. Do you have a nickname and what is it? Mm, uh, I mean, Georgina will tell you yes, but I, <laughs> I don't go by this nickname. Oh, I'm actually wearing flannel today, too. One time on my teaching evaluations, and I thought this was hilarious, I guess I wore a lot of flannel and plaid shirts that particular year. <clears throat> Somebody put, instructor looks like a dreamy lumberjack, and I told, I made the mistake of telling Georgina that, and uh, it's haunted me for the past 
probably five to seven years. So um, no one else calls me that, but I'll roll by her office sometimes and she'll joke me and say, oh, you got the plaid on. Oh, you're going with the lumberjack look today. So I guess uh, to some people, I do have a nickname, but no one else outside of the university always have a nickname. There, there may have been a time... It. Yeah, but there may have been it. a time when I uh, encouraged that nickname unintentionally in front of students, <laughs> by the way. So, uh, my bad. Uh, I do tell my students, I try to tell them some of the funny evaluations that I've gotten over the years after I do the evaluations, and they usually think that's pretty funny. Well, thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is awesome. I saw Georgina start to smile, and I was like, I know what she's thinking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What is the first thing that you would buy if you won a lottery? First thing I would buy. Hmm. I I love guitar, so I would probably buy like a really high end like Martin guitar, which they can be like five thousand dollars or a lot more than that. So maybe something like that. Awesome. Oh. I did not know you played guitar. Oh, I have a, I have a huge wall of guitars in one of our rooms, that <gasps> all different types of electric, acoustic. I have a little what? Martin, little Martin mini like Ed Sheeran plays, but it's like the base model, and it was only like five hundred dollars. But Martin makes Martin makes some. Uh, they have ones that are like twenty thousand dollars. So sweet. That is cool. Well, there you go. I don't think I would have chosen something as cool. So, <laughs> all right. What phobias, if any, do you have? Oh, I don't like heights. I really don't like heights. Like a, a little bit up on a ladder is okay, but if I had to like go up on my roof or something like that, it's just, uh, huh? I don't really like like bridges with gate with like, like the Mackinac Bridge has like grates where you can see the water. Not a fan of that even though I'm in a car and there's no danger. It's just like, makes my makes me feel nervous. Totally fair. I know a lot of people have that. <laughs> so, <laughs> the first thing that came to mind is, I don't know if you've ever been to House on the Rock. But they mm -hmm. have like, they have like a, a, a lookout point over a, a canyon. It's just glass that you walk out onto. Oh, oh not gosh. For me. Was, not, no, not for I me. don't even, I don't mind heights, but that's terrifying to me. <laughs> there's just too many possibilities there. that could happen. Yeah, not for me. Um, what places have you lived in? Uh, I lived in Milwaukee for six years for grad school, but during grad school, I went and uh, did a, actually a political psychology institute at Stanford over the summer one year. So it was, I lived in Palo Alto for a short amount of time. And then two other summers I spent at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, so I guess temporarily Ann Arbor, I rented an apartment there for the summer. I'll actually be there on Wednesday because I'm going to give a talk at Western Ontario and we're stopping at, at Ann Arbor along the way because it's such a cool city and staying one night there. So, and then Green Bay, obviously. I was born and raised in Green Bay. And so I lived here for like 20 some years and then left and came back. So awesome. Nothing, awesome. nothing too exotic, but. You're a, a UWGB alum. That's right. Ooh. That's awesome. All right, what TV show or movie are you ashamed to admit that you love? I'm a big History Channel fan and I like have seen every episode of American Pickers like a hundred times. That's like, the <laughs> I just love that show. I, I'm not even really, I don't collect antiques. I don't like, not something that I personally am like into, but for some reason that show just like, I, I just find it fascinating how they mm -hmm. just like, my husband stuff. Like, like went that? to high school with the uh, uh, the guys from. Oh, America. I think you told me that. Yeah, because they're from Iowa. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so we were watching it one day, and he's like, "Wow, those guys look so familiar." He's like, "Wait a second, I went to high school with them." That's crazy. <laughs> what is this show? I've never heard of American this. Pickers. Yeah. Oh, what? it's it's these it's these two guys, Mike and Frank, who travel around the United States in a big cargo van, and they sometimes have leads where they have it arranged to go look at somebody's collection or barn or whatever, uh, old business, and they try to find like huh. signs and 
toys and any any kind of old thing and then they have a shop where they sell it but they find some cool stuff like i mean some of the stuff that they find is like old motorcycles from the early 1900s that are worth like, like sometimes they spend like ninety thousand dollars buying a couple motorcycles and then sell them and make a profit i need you to know that when you just based on the name I thought this was going to be right up my alley because I thought it was someone who worked at an apple orchard. I, it was like, I was like, oh, sweet. A show about like migrant workers, right? A show about a show about people who pick fruit. Nope. So nope. Wow. I am very disappointed. Could have come like full circle, but it didn't. Not at all. Yeah. I will tell you that's a better show in my mind. I want to see the show about uh, American apple pickers uh, make a spinoff. So... Outstanding. Um, that was the last question, right, Kelsey? Awesome. Aaron, thank you so much for being here. Um, all three of us are doing something at Common Cause, um, so which is really cool. Aaron, you're going to be talking with some legislators, which is great. We got a panel of legislators coming, to, coming that day to speak. That's going to be great. Georgina, you and the Psychology Club are playing, sounds like a pretty cool game. We're, we're doing a, uh, uh, a game, a competition called Neuro Myth or Truth. Uh, it's about, um, the, it actually comes from our friend Regan Gurung and Oregon State University put together a deck of cards that uh, are true false questions based on empirical evidence. And so we're going to have psychology students, um, sport exercise and performance grad students, psych faculty and non-psych faculty compete to see nice. who does better in knowing the difference between neuro myth and truth. That is cool. I am actually doing something on social media scholarship. So talking a little bit about uh, how and when and why scholars should be active on social media and trying to share information and some of the upsides and downsides of such activities. Um, Aaron, what do you have to plug for us? First of all, tell people where they can find you. I know you're on Twitter. Yep, I'm on Twitter. My Twitter handle is just my first name, last name, Aaron Weinstein. You can look Perfect. it up on the GB homepage to get the spelling right or just start typing Aaron Wine and it'll probably come up because most people don't have that, <laughs> that <laughs> handle or that last name. Uh, I'm also doing another thing for Common Cause. My Research lab class is, uh, has fielded a poll and we actually just got all the data back representative uh, survey of Wisconsinites. So now my students are diving in and writing up what we found. We asked all kinds of stuff on how do you feel about different issues? We've got stuff on voting, marijuana legalization, uh, unionization, like 20 different criminal justice reforms in Wisconsin. So they're, they're dividing and conquering and they're gonna write up um, some blog posts, which will be like one of the first presentations of this data. So we'll probably have six or eight different blog posts on different issues where the students have taken the lead and writing them up and doing the analysis with my help. So there will be a chance to learn a lot of stuff about Wisconsin, what Wisconsinites think about different issues. Very, very cool. That sounds awesome. And thank you. I'd forgotten that you also had that piece, but that's really, really great. Uh, G, do you have anything to plug before we finish up? Anything you want people to know about? I do not, but they can catch me on uh, social media at G-E-O-R-J-E-A-N-N-A-W-D. Very cool. I have a weird thing I want to plug, and so forgive me, but um, it, it, it literally just came out about 10 minutes ago, but I tried my hand at humor writing for the first time formally, and I had something published in McSweeney's this morning, um, which- Wow, uh, that's so cool. That really <laughs> thank cool. you very much. It is, I, I'm gonna credit our friend and former guest on the show, Jenny Young, for giving me the, uh, the inspiration to, to write something. It is a very, very specific piece. I didn't think anyone would think it was funny, but me. Uh, it is about the 1978 Halloween movie, uh, and it is titled, I know you're probably still traumatized from the Halloween night spree killings, but are you available to babysit this weekend? Um, and <laughs> it was really, really fun to write, and I'm glad and surprised and honored that they accepted it, but go check that out. Uh, it'll be posted someplace, I'm sure. Um, so 
Um, in fact, Kelsey, awesome. I may send it to you to post on psych and stuff. Um, anyways, it's a weird little thing. I might do more of it if, uh, cause I had a lot of fun. So, um, let's see, uh, what else we got? Uh, Kelsey, tell people where they can find what you and psych and stuff are up to. Yeah, absolutely. So our handle is at psych and stuff or on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. But you can get to YouTube using either our Instagram account or our Facebook account. Very good. Um, Georgina, thank you so much for, uh, for, for co-hosting. You already gave your um, uh, social media handle. You can find me at Anger Professor on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, all sorts of places. Aaron, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate the great conversation and the work you're doing at Common Cause. That's going to be really great. I can't wait. Psychology and Stuff is a production out of Phoenix Studios at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. The executive producer is Ryan Martin and the production manager is Kate Parley. Our audio production coordinator is Bill Salek. Our graphic designer is Kimberly Vlees and our intern is Kelsey Engelhardt. Special thanks to today's guest, Dr. Aaron Weinshank. If you haven't already, please make sure to rate, review, and subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform. You can also head over to our website, uwgb.edu slash podcast to check out past episodes of this and all our shows. I'm your host, Ryan Martin, and I'm here with my co-host, Georgina Wilson-Dungess. Keep being amazing.